for Wednesday, November 21st, 2012. I'm Kevin Hurley. This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education. Fairwinds is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate policymakers, the public, and the next generation on matters of nuclear power and safety. Today on the show, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has dispatched a special investigation team to two U.S. nuclear power plants following Hurricane Sandy. We'll talk about why. Also, the hurricane washed out roads and knocked out power. We'll talk about what this means in the big picture of emergency planning. Finally, on today's special edition podcast, we'll look into why some reactor operators have said they'll shut down if forced to spend more money on safety issues. Now let's get to Arnie. Arnie, thanks for joining us again this week. Hey, Kevin. Thanks. and thanks. Um, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone who's listening. Well, I want to start right out with uh, two special investigation teams that have been dispatched by the NRC, one to Turkey Point and the other to Oyster Creek following Hurricane Sandy. Can you talk a little bit about what they're doing and why they're there? Uh, Yeah, you know, the NRC doesn't dispatch these teams very often. The key is they're special. Um, But two problems happened last week that, um, that they felt warranted a lot of extra attention, so they sent these these SIT teams, special investigation teams, out. Um, the the interesting one is Turkey Point. Um, they had valves go closed, and then they couldn't open them. And the valves were in the system that's designed to cool the nuclear reactor in the service water system. Um, this creates the the problem that uh, we've been talking about now since uh, Fukushima Daiichi, which is the something called the loss of the ultimate heat sink. So. Um, no one knows why these valves closed. They weren't supposed to, and, and why they couldn't get them back open is even uh, more of a, a, a dilemma. Um, they, so there was a period of about 30 minutes where the cooling system for the, uh, the nuclear reactor, um, the emergency core cooling system for the nuclear reactor, was inoperable because these valves had, uh, had, had failed uh, open, uh, failed, to, uh, failed closed, and they couldn't get them back open again. So the, the NRC felt that that was warranted attention. What the heck is going on here? But then, then up at Oyster Creek, they had um, a similar problem, loss of the ultimate heat sink, but, but for a different cause, which is the, uh, the Hurricane Sandy. We were talking um, over the last week here on the podcast about how the storm surge from Sandy came within about six inches of wiping out the same system, the emergency service water system. Now, you know, this is supposed to be a robust system and um, should be ro- uh, immune to these kinds of problems. But, um, but here we've had two cases in a week where the emergency uh, service water system was compromised. It's, it's, um, it's disconcerting at the same time, uh, uh, you know, the NRC's response to send out teams is, uh, is certainly appropriate because, my God, this is the... Uh, uh, this is the, the final line of defense is being able to cool the nuclear reactor. So, Arnie, San- Hurricane Sandy washed out roads and knocked out uh, power. Um, you know, these plants are required to have an emergency evacuation plan. How now, with a lot of this infrastructure damage still there, uh, how now are they planning for an emergency if one were to happen today? Well, that, that's a great question. Oyster Creek is um, is in trouble. The the uh, infrastructure around the plant, not, not the plant itself. We're talking about the public roads, the public uh, um, you know sewers and, and, and shelters and things like that, are are still um, being strained because of issues related to Hurricane Sandy. And those are the same pieces of infrastructure that you need in the case of a nuclear accident. So here we've got a plant that uh, plans to come back up. Oyster Creek is planning to come back up any minute now, and yet its emergency um, uh, its emergency evacuation plant won't work in the event that uh, uh, that there would be an accident. And There's, they'll be allowed to do this. Well, that, that's a great question too. There's an attorney, attorney Richard Webster, has determined that uh, Oyster Creek is violating 10 CFR 50 Part 73 which is a a clause that says you've got to have an operating evacuation plan to run a nuclear reactor. And you're required to tell the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when you don't have an operable plan. So um, 
you know, uh, Attorney Webster's written to the NRC. He wrote to him yesterday saying, uh, what, what's going on here? You guys aren't doing your job. The, 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 the plant for the last, since Sandy now, for, for two weeks now, uh, the plant has had an inoperable emergency plan. And uh, you haven't been notified by the, by the people that run Oyster Creek, and you really haven't been too curious about it either. So both the owner and the NRC are remiss here in failing to apply the law that's on the books to, um, uh, to Oyster Creek. You know, it, it gets more serious than that because Oyster Creek's the oldest plant in the country. It, was, it went online in 1969. And... It doesn't have a high-pressure coolant injection system. It's the only plant in the country that doesn't have an HPCI, high-pressure coolant injection system. Arnie, before you go on, what is a high-pressure coolant injection system? Well, if there's an accident, the reactor's at a very high pressure, and it would be great to get water into it while it's at a high pressure. Then you would use the high-pressure coolant injection system to pump water into the reactor in the event of an accident. Now... There are other systems, so when the pressure gets lower, you use something called the low-pressure coolant injection system, or the, uh, and there's a couple other systems at Oyster Creek. But you need the high-pressure coolant injection system for something called the small line break accident. That's when a, a three-inch line breaks. But the reactor stays hot, and it also stays at high pressure. So... Um, Fluid leaks out through this three-inch line that's broken, and uh, at Oyster Creek, there's no way to make it up. So what has to happen at Oyster Creek is the operators have to manually open up a whole bunch of relief valves to rapidly drop the pressure. So in order to solve the problem at Oyster Creek, you, you rely on the operators doing the right thing. So this is a new technology that Oyster Creek doesn't have because it's one of the older plants. Right. Nobody thought of uh, high-pressure coolant injection when Oyster Creek was being built. And then afterward, they realized, oh, my God, you know, this is, uh, uh, we really need another safety system, this high-pressure coolant injection system. So it was added to all the other reactors after Oyster Creek. Now, it's, it's worse than that because uh, just this week, Oyster Creek announced that it found cracks in a three-inch line. So they're, um, they're in the process of patching the cracks in the three-inch line. But, uh, so here we've got all of the predecessors, of, uh, precursors of, a, of an accident. We've got a three-inch line with cracks. We've got no high-pressure coolant injection system to cool the plant. And we've got an evacuation plan that won't work because Hurricane Sandy has basically wiped out the infrastructure. You know, here, here's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowing Oyster Creek to run in the 21st century when it doesn't have all of the cooling systems that were invented in the 20th century. Now, you, you'd think that um, given they found a crack in a three-inch pipe that could be a precursor, and given that they need this high-pressure coolant injection system were that, uh, were that pipe to crack, and also given they don't have an evacuation plan, that the NRC would say, well, Oyster Creek, we don't want you starting up. But that's not happening. Uh, it looks to me like the NRC and Exelon, the owner of Oyster Creek, are merrily on their way to getting this plant back up online, uh, and the public safety is at risk. So, Arnie, if Exelon wanted to go about getting back online the proper way and getting their emergency plan in line, what would they be doing? Well, Exelon has already said that if they have to make any improvements to Oyster Creek, they're going to shut it down instead. Th this came out in their, um, they had a call with a, a bunch of stock analysts just this week. And they said that the plant is marginal right now. and They're not making any money on it. If they have to modify it anymore as a result of Hurricane Sandy, it's likely they'll shut it down. Now, it's a second domino to fall. You know, we've had the, um, uh, the Kiwani reactor uh, that we talked about two weeks ago on the podcast, and they were saying that uh, Kiwani won't start up again in, after March of 2013 because they just can't afford to keep it running. And, and so here we've got Exelon Management saying that they're not going to make any substantial improvements in Oyster Creek. So basically, um, the, you know, the NRC knows that, and if the NRC insists that um, Oyster Creek actually have an operating 
emergency plan, actually install a high-pressure coolant injection system and, um, and things like that. They, they know Exelon will probably uh, shut the reactor down. And, um, you know, I don't think the NRC really wants to be the cause of a nuclear reactor shutting down. Uh, despite the fact that it's really all about money uh, versus public safety. The NRC should be on the public safety side. And Exelon should be on the money side, but it looks to me like the uh, the NRC is more concerned about Exelon's costs compared to the uh, the public safety of people down there in New Jersey. You know, it, it's not the only one that's uh, th this issue of money keeps coming up. We had two more in, in the last two weeks raise the issue of their rent that they're they're not really financially viable. Oyster Creek isn't the only um, the only reactor that's experiencing financial problems. We've got Kiwani we know about. But two others have popped up on the radar uh, this week, and they're surprised because they're newer reactors. The Wolf Creek reactor announced that it's looking for a partner to share engineering with. In other words, they want to lay off engineers uh, and spread the engineering uh, load over uh, more reactors so there's uh, they can get fewer uh, nuclear engineers per reactor to drop their cost. And and Callaway said the same thing. Both of these are new reactors in the Midwest. Um, they're saying basically that the cost to run a nuclear reactor makes them uncompetitive in, uh, in today's environment. So we've got four reactors in the last month talking about they, um, they're having trouble making economic sense about running. Kiwani, Oyster Creek, Callaway, and, and Wolf Creek. And you got to believe there's others out there, too. Quite a few nuclear plants are, are losing money at night. Uh, at night when there's extra load, the, um, the cost of um, other people providing power is much lower than nuclear plants. So nuclear plants are no longer the, uh, the low-cost uh, provider of power. So several plants considering shutting down if it gets more expensive. I think in fifth grade, we would have said, uh, is that a threat or a promise? Is that a threat or a promise? I think, you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is painfully aware that if they make these plants any safer, they'll make them more costly. And they don't want to make them more costly. Now, this is at the commission level. There's, there's four of the five commissioners, uh, with the exception of the new, the new chairman, Allison McFarland, have basically said that nuclear power is safe enough as it is and we really don't see any need to make any changes. Then the market is sending signals saying, if you make any changes, we're going to start shutting these guys down. So, you know, again, I think that we're confusing public safety and economics and the NRC's sole focus should be on public safety. But it looks to me that at the commission level, they, they've made the decision that we're really not going to see uh, safety changes as a result of um, the Daiichi accident and you know therefore the plants are not going to be as safe but they're going to be more economic to run which um, which keeps a lot of their corporations um, in business you know we're, we're seeing this elsewhere too we're, we're seeing it at, uh, at Fort Calhoun in the uh, again in the Midwest this is a, a really old reactor as well Fort Calhoun is the one that was flooded, and the one I talked about saying that sandbags and nuclear plants don't belong in the same, uh, the same sentence. Well, Fort Calhoun is costing something between 5 and $10 million a month to pay the salaries of the people who are not producing electricity. Now, this plant hasn't been producing electricity since uh, April of last year, so you know, we're looking at uh, more than a year when, uh, when uh, all these people are making salaries. And, uh, and so we're looking at over $100 million, pushing $200 million at a power plant that the world is telling us is not economical to operate. But what happens there is that the people in, um, uh, this is part of the, the um, Nebraska Public Power District, the people in the Midwest have been funding these salaries for so long in their, in their electric bill that they really don't realize they're spending five or ten million dollars a month paying salaries for people to, to, to not operate a nuclear power plant. Just this week, the people at Fort Calhoun came out and said that uh, they found structural problems at the plant. Just this week, the people at Fort Calhoun came out and said that 
they found structural problems at the plant. And now they're going to have to be shut down even longer. Structural problems in the nuclear containment that they were unaware of. So, Arnie, maybe you can help me understand about how expensive is it to keep running these plants when they're shut down? Um, and when I say running, I don't mean to have the reactor running and to have the plant providing power, but rather, you know, obviously the plant has to employ safety personnel and engineers and, you know, all of the employees for a plant must still cost money. How expensive is that for a plant that's shut down? Yeah, the the power plant out in California offers an example of a, a situation where uh, this this is the the the, uh, the San Onofre plant. They've got close to two thousand people, uh, and they're highly paid engineers bringing in you know upwards of a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year on average. So you're you're looking at more than a hundred million dollars a year, pushing two hundred million dollars a year for the uh, the San Onofre plant to um, to sit idle uh, for these people to collect salaries, basically producing no electricity. There's two more examples besides the San Onofre plant. The first example is um, Fort Calhoun, and they've got a staff of about six or seven hundred. And again, that's probably sixty to a hundred million dollars a year being spent to keep a plant idle. And the other one here is on the on the east coast is Crystal River down in Florida, and. It's got a huge staff, and, and it's likely costing $150 million a year to keep idle. Now, Crystal River is going to be shut down for five or six years with containment problems. Here's Fort Calhoun plant now has containment problems. Now, Crystal River has containment problems. So these plants will be shut down for five years, and they'll pay the salaries of more than 1,000 people for five years to produce no power. You know, the analogy I like to say is that uh, I like to compare it to the NFL. You know, if you've got a quarterback who breaks his arm, uh, you'll, you'll let him sit out a season. And that's sort of understandable. But the expectation is he comes back at the end of the season. Well, here we've got you know, Crystal River is going to be down for six years. What NFL team would make the business decision to keep their quarterback on the sidelines and pay his exorbitant salary for six years hoping that sooner or later he'll come back and, and, and lead the team again. And, and the same with San Onofre. San Onofre uh, Unit 3 is likely shut down forever, and Unit uh, Unit 2 is going to be shut down for more than a year and, and, and likely never get to 100% power again. And yet we've got this, this expensive quarterback, all of these hundreds and hundreds of highly paid engineers uh, sitting on the sideline. And in the back of our minds, we keep saying, well, sooner or later it will run. Businesses don't make that decision. Utilities make that decision when they can take the money from ratepayers out of your, out of your electric bill. The, the utilities, uh, Crystal River is owned by a utility, and but what that means is that whether it runs or not, the people that, that, that own Crystal River get paid. The same with San Onofre and the same with Fort Calhoun. Whether it runs or not, those staffs get paid because they get it out of your electric bill. The other plants, Kiwani and Oyster Creek, are what we call pension plants. And when they're not running, they're not getting any money. And management suddenly behaves like business people. They, they pull the plug on a plant and they say, we can't afford to operate this plant. So what we're seeing in the nuclear industry is a split. The, the people that are running merchant plants, the that aren't really connected to any single utility, they just sell power out on the grid, are looking at the balance sheets on these nuclear reactors and they're saying, these don't make any sense. And the same thing is happening to Fort Calhoun or, or San Onofre or Crystal River don't make any sense either. But because ratepayers have been paying these salaries for 10 or 20 or 30 years in their rate base, they don't feel like somebody has just lifted $200 million from their pocket. If ratepayers understood that these plants shut down is like having your quarterback on the sideline for five years, they might demand of their public utility commission, so why are we spending, in the case of Crystal River, $750 million in salaries for people to sit around at a power plant that's not operating? It doesn't make business sense, but... The utility commissions in, in Florida and California 
are, are, are turning a blind eye to that. And they're basically in a, a very highly paid employment program for engineers to to sit around and produce no power. Arnie, wouldn't it be nice if uh, Fairwinds was funded by the uh, ratepayers in the U.S.? Boy, that would make my day, I'll tell you, Kevin. <laughs> just just uh, essentially send us um, at eight million people watch the Fairwinds um, um, website since the Fukushima Daiichi accident, and. Uh, if everybody just just left a dollar at our door for every time they they viewed the site, um, I'll, I'll tell you we would be uh, uh, ten times more, a um, hundred times better as, as I'm reporting the news than we are now. Uh, yes, we don't we don't uh, tap into your pocketbook uh, um, through um, through an IV line and drain cash uh, routinely like utilities do. Though we rely on donations and. Uh, it's Thanksgiving, and I hope that maybe Fairwinds is one of the things you're thankful for. Between now and the end of the year, uh, Fairwinds is trying to raise funds both from uh, uh, corporations and large donors and, and also small donors. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's very humbling to go to the mailbox and, 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 and get that um, and open an envelope that says, thank you, um, you know, here's, here's $20. I really appreciate everything you're doing. It, it really uh, uh, makes me aware of how little information is out there uh, that the mainstream media is not covering and we really try our best but uh, we can't do it for for um for zero funds and would certainly appreciate a donation arnie gunderson it sounds like you have some action going on in the background there um yeah there's some kids playing out uh, right outside of my skype connection with you <laughs> Joining us via Skype from on the road, Arnie Gunderson, Fairwinds Chief Nuclear Engineer. Arnie, thanks for coming on for the special edition. I also want to remind viewers that there will be no regular Sunday podcast this coming Sunday uh, because of the holiday. So the special edition podcast will stay up until next Sunday.